we can start good day to all of you i am saying good day because uh, we see a lot of people have joined from different countries 25 different countries so we welcome you all uh, we are happy uh, that you are joining us uh, to your webinar uh, on our empowering chakopreneurs webinar series and then uh, today we are you know arthili is going to talk about innovations in brazil how not just the uh, coco beans uh, coco tree has lot more to offer and she is going to tell us but before uh, you know, and arthili has worked in chocolate for a long time in different levels and she has played a major role in uh, chocolate industry in brazil and we especially women uh, in brazil so she will talk more about her and also you can read her bio on our website so first i just want to give a brief introduction about coco town because we see lot of uh, new uh, customers are uh, and uh, new participants are uh, joining this webinar so please uh, give me like a 5 minutes to share brief history of kokoto and then we will turn the mic to arcelia so uh, kokoto was uh, if you look at the origin we started the parent company inno concepts in 1992 we started uh, you know um, trading specialty uh food processing machines innovative food we didn't want to just sell something we wanted to sell something that's different that's unique so we started trading and then we focused on machines for specialty food for south indian not even whole india but in south india there is some specialty food we call idli and dosa so we started selling machines for that and then Uh, over the years, we found out that people who were buying our machines, they were also using for other purposes, not just the South Indian food. And then in twenty, uh, in two thousand seven, there was a recession in US, and our business was affected. So we were thinking how to repair it. Um, <clears throat> so we wanted to switch focus uh, and not just depend on. one customer base only like other also very limited customer base because like i said it was a south indian cooking so we were looking at and uh, what are the things people have used our machines for and we found out that some people were actually using it to make chocolate and we asked them what it takes and they were saying the chocolate grinding is different than any other grinding because of the food processing that we were using for south indian food you have to grind 20 minutes and you use it one you know maximum three times a week so it's uh, that's all they were using but for the chocolate they were grinding for two to three days so we said okay let's focus on chocolate industry and we started uh, making machines for the chocolate industry so and then in 2009 so we formed a new company called coco town under the parent company and then we wanted to facilitate the evolution of coco as a superfood and then enable chaco produce with machines at affordable cost and also help the chocolate makers make chocolate as a healthy food instead of a junk food and also help coco farmers in the process to produce flavor beans where they can get more money so they can uh, climb up the economic ladder <clears throat> so this is uh, like a short timeline of uh, coco town Um, so in 1994 we introduced the indian wet grinders and then uh, we had all these machines we come the first commercial grinder was introduced in 2007 and we also went and applied the patents so now we have the patents for three or four machines and more patents are on the way and then again uh, in 2020 we had to pivot because of the worldwide pandemic so we uh, we not talked to our customers and found their um, pinch point so earlier uh, we also started a bean to bar workshop in um, 2014 because we found that a lot of people wanted to get into the bean to bar industry but uh, they didn't have the um, you know the edge, uh, the theoretical theoretical background to start it so we worked with a lot of um, international experts and we had a three day boot camp we call it so people come here and they make a batch of chocolate not just chocolate they also learned how to grow the business what is involved in the business from starting uh, you know buying the beans all the way to wrapping the bar and selling it and then in 2020 we said the physical uh, interaction was not possible anymore 
so uh, thankfully the zoom and other you know platforms came us uh, to help so now we are doing uh, webinars we call it empowering chakopreneurs uh, because uh, we are believe coco town is not just in the business of selling machines but we are in the business of creating and empowering chakopreneurs because our um, happiness comes knowing that our customers are growing their business and they are supporting the farmers in the you know in turn and making the farmers lives better and also their customers are happy because they are getting the healthy chocolate so the whole world is a better place and then so now we are doing a uh, empowering chocopreneurs education equipment and evaluation tools and we are also trying to create the online cocoversity for all the resources related to chocolate and then we are trying to develop more tools that will help the farmers and then we are hoping you know now the vaccination is available we are hoping normal life will return and we can meet friends and family face to face but we will still continue the virtual connections because it is helping a lot of our customers that we are finding out so we will still keep this and i just want to end with the small sloka we say loka samasta sukhino bhavantu which means you know and all the beings everywhere in the universe will be happy and free and may the thoughts words and actions of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and to that freedom for all so thank you all and now arcelia i will turn the mic to you thank you so good morning everyone i'm going to be sharing my screen here uh so give me a second So my name is Arcelia. I am the chocolate maker and owner of Mission Chocolate and we're based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I have been in the chocolate industry for about 19 years now. First as a chocolatier with a store in Berkeley, California, and now as a chocolate maker in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um before I decided to go on this journey of becoming a chocolate maker and a chocolatier i did a uh five month tour through europe and i decided that i wanted to learn everything about chocolate so i bought a one way flight to ireland and i spent five months eating chocolate in europe and this was one of the best research projects i have ever done in my life so i finished my five months in europe went to california and i opened my store in berkeley and i used i would make desserts uh i was what we call a remelter i would buy chocolate from guitar chocolate and i would melt it into truffles and bars and desserts uh but then i really wanted to get a little bit deeper into understanding where cocoa came from where it grows and i wanted to work with farmers So I sold my store in Berkeley and then I did the same adventure of traveling but this time in Latin America. So I started in Mexico and then I just worked my way down. I went to Belize, Guatemala, Panama, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru and I learned to work with cocoa in its essence. and along the way i learned a lot about drinking chocolates and so one of my passions is drinking cocoa which is very difficult to explain um if you didn't grow up with this sort of drinking chocolate basically everyone in latin america grew up with this sort of drinking chocolate it doesn't have one name but it's a drinking cocoa or cacao drinks something along those lines but i'm very passionate about drinking cocoa and so i began a lot of work with indigenous women throughout latin america so uh zapotec women in mexico uh nabe women in uh panama and i worked in peru as well and so for me chocolate is a little bit of everything right it's a drink it's a bar it's a dessert it's it it became many things the more that i moved on in my career with chocolate so after i did a little bit of my traveling in latin america 
I started to work at Dandelion Chocolate. So one of my favorite chocolate factories in the world, Dandelion Chocolate in San Francisco. So I actually learned to make chocolate with Dandelion Chocolate. Uh, I spent about a year with them making chocolate and traveling with Greg, who is their uh, cocoa sorcerer. He goes throughout the world sourcing cocoa for the factory. And I would travel with him. And so I understood a little bit more about what it took to um, produce good quality cocoa. After all of that, I decided to move to Brazil. And that's really when Mission Chocolate began. So Mission Chocolate has a name Mission because really my mission is a lot of things. But also I learned to make chocolate in the Mission District of San Francisco, which is in at Dandelion Chocolate. And so um, the word mission really implies many things. And I also teach chocolate making classes and I teach people to taste chocolate. I traveled through Latin America to teach people also to work with chocolate. So really the word mission involves a lot. Um, and now I uh, have a little factory in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. Right now I'm in a little, I'm in an even littler factory in California. So this is my workshop. This is my experimental lab that I have when I come to California. Uh, but the real factory, the, the big one is based in Sao Paulo. And uh, part of my work in Brazil is not only making chocolate, but it is helping the world and Brazilians to understand that Brazilian cocoa and Brazilian chocolate is one of the best that exist. So we do that by holding a lot of events around Brazilian chocolate and cocoa. We do that by traveling outside of Brazil and sharing our chocolate and our cocoa. And then of course, all of these wonderful products that I'm gonna show you today are also what distinguish Brazil in the world of cocoa and chocolate. So that's a little bit about me. I, um, I personally, I'll tell you, I have three children. I have a four-year-old, a two-year-old and a five-month-old. And so, um, chocolate now has turned into something else for me, right? So now it's something that I prepare for my children. Uh, it's something we drink together. So I'm teaching them to drink cocoa. I'm teaching them to eat 80% chocolate, 90% chocolate. Uh, and so it's now becoming shifting into something else. So it's, it's a world that I love being a part of. I, will, I don't think I will ever leave the chocolate industry because it evolved into so many things. Uh, but it, it definitely changes and it shifts, right? And so what I'm going to talk to you today about is it's that shift is thousands of years ago, we started with cacao as a drink, right? It was only a drink. It's only been very, very recently, let's say 300 years versus 300 years of eating chocolate versus the thousands of years that we've been drinking chocolate. And so the eating chocolate industry uh, is very young, it's very new, and it definitely hasn't done everything that it's capable of doing, right? There's still so much more that can be done. And given that I've traveled to 16 countries in Europe, all the countries I've been to in Latin America, all the research that I do about chocolate and cocoa, I, I will have to admit that the things that I see in Brazil, I have never seen anywhere else. And I am so proud of everything that the Brazilian uh, cocoa and chocolate makers have accomplished because it is truly innovative. And that's really a word that I would use, innovative. There, I just haven't seen it anywhere else. So today we're gonna to talk about a little bit of those things that I see being made in Brazil that could really uh, be used elsewhere in the world. Now, the things that I will talk about is not everything that could be done with, with a certain part of the cocoa pod. What I'm talking about are things that I have never seen anywhere else, right? So for example, I do not talk about cacao husk tea, right? The cocoa husk tea, because they are doing it in Brazil, but they're also doing it everywhere else. They do it in the US, they sell it in Australia, they in Canada, I've seen cocoa husk tea, everywhere. So I don't talk about it because it's not anything new that I have seen. All the things that we're going to discuss today that I'm going to show you are things that Brazilians are doing that I have not seen anywhere else. 
and I'll have to be honest with you that I had to, I had to give myself a hard stop on working on this presentation because it just went on and on and on and on. So maybe at a later time, we can do part two of this because it really was endless. The more I, I looked and the, the more I found. And so for me, Brazilians have done a really great job of utilizing every single part of the cocoa pod. And again, we're not discussing anything chocolate related today. So, um, so within the chocolate world, there's a lot of things that Brazilians are also doing that are uh, unique, special, delicious. Um, and that I didn't include any of that in here because today we're not talking about chocolate. We're talking about everything else that could be done that's related to the cocoa pot or the cacao fruit, right? And so let's get started. And you're able to ask questions in the chat. You don't have to, I will stop and answer your questions because um, I think it's important if you have, if you need any clarification, we you will stop and answer your questions, okay? So um, I don't know how much everyone on this presentation understands about cocoa fruit or chocolate or cacao. So I'm just giving you a really brief image here of what I'm talking about. So here is an image of a cocoa fruit that I opened. I opened it up and then I let the cocoa seeds drain. So I let them drip, right? So the cocoa seeds just drip and they drip and they drip their natural juice or nectar. And that's what we call cacao honey. We set that aside. And then I manually removed the pulp from the seeds and that becomes cacao pulp. If I put the cacao honey in a dehydrator or in the oven at 50 Celsius, three hours, then we get the cacao honey leather. If I put the cacao honey on a stove and I cook it for, it could be several hours, it becomes cacao molasses. And so all of these things come from the cacao pod, but they are not chocolate, right? And so then this would be the base for a lot of the things that we'll be discussing. So these are four products. And then you have the cacao seeds and the cacao nibs. It, it's, you could say cocoa nibs, cocoa seeds. It's interchangeable, okay? No, it, it doesn't matter. It's cacao pulp or cocoa pulp, same thing. So this is kind of the starting point. And then we're gonna start with cacao honey. In Portuguese, it, this is melchi cacao directly translates to cacao honey. So it's the first nectar or liquid that comes out of the cocoa pod. Here you see a pretty um, rustic way of removing it. Brazil has some of the strictest laws around sanitation. And so if it is made for sale, it, it would not be prepared this way. But if you go to any cocoa farm around the world, if you have been privileged enough to be on a farm and you know that some the farmers will open a cocoa pod for you and then will let you suck on the seeds and it's the most refreshing thing in the world. So here is that multiply, right? So here they put a lot of seeds in a mesh and then the liquid will drain out. So what you see here on the banana leaves is the nectar, is the cacao honey. And so the cacao honey tastes a little bit like uh, pineapple. It has, an, it has a really nice acidity. It's extremely sweet. Um, some people may say it tastes like lychee. Uh, it's spectacular. Like I have never in my life met anyone that does not like cacao honey because it's, it's just liquid gold. It's amazing. It's some of the most amazing things that you can never imagine. I have known people that don't like chocolate. I understand. But this, there's no way you cannot like it. It is, it's just the best thing. I don't know if you have never had it, you have to go to a farm just to try this. And so people on a farm right, would drink this. Um, and this becomes the base for a lot of other products. 
uh, I want to say that if you live in the United States and you think you have tried cacao pulp, you haven't. Because everything that leaves Brazil or I think any other country that produces melgi cacao, cacao honey, uh, it has to be pasteurized. So a lot changes in that process. So even though you can go to your grocery store or even some chocolate makers in the US, uh, in Europe, and I think Canada, Australia are selling uh, cacao honey or cacao juice, it, it does not taste the same as you being on a farm. So what we are, are able to grab here in Brazil tastes a lot better for whatever you are, whatever you have access to in a cacao producing country tastes a lot better than what you get once it's exported. Uh, one quick question, Arcelia. Yeah. So how long does it take for the uh, cacao uh, honey to come out of the, uh, the pulp? Well, it doesn't take a long time. So, okay, um, minutes, maybe an hour, something like this, because you have to also um, be respectful that this cacao is going to be fermented, right? So you don't want it to begin fermenting here. This cacao is going to be processed to be made into chocolate. So you open this up. Uh, so you see all the cocoa pods here are fresh, right? None of these cocoa pods are old. Like these cocoa pods are cut and all of those cocoa seeds are white. Um, they're pretty clean, they're white. And so that means that this is, has not been sitting here for more than a day, right? So this is, you, you're in the field, you crack it open, you put it on here and it immediately starts to come out. Um, also, you have to understand that there is a ripeness level that you have to target to get this. If you're harvesting green pods or overripe pods, you're not gonna get this. So this cacao honey has to come from pods that are perfectly ripe, right? So, and you could see that in this photo. Thank you. Uh, okay, so then, um, in Brazil, we have a company that's called Dengo. And everything that I'm showing you, I've purposely have left the brand or the website on here so that you, if you want more information, you could just go to their website and you can um, see what they have to offer. So Dengo is a fairly new chocolate factory in Brazil. And you can go into their store and you could buy this cacao honey in a jar. This, again, is one of the most delicious things you ever have, right? So um, getting this into a packaged product and being able to sell it at your chocolate store really adds value to your brand, right? Because from here, you can take that and make a lot of other things. So we're gonna get into here. So this is the juice or the honey. If you cook that honey down, you can make this jam. So this is the jalea what we call jalea g cacao, which is that nectar cooked very softly. So this is not the molasses. This cacao jam has been cooked uh, at a very low temperature, very slowly so that it can maintain that color and not become like a, a dark caramel, right? So this is not a dark caramel. This is just like a lightly cooked uh, cacao honey. And this is what we call cacao jam. Again, here is another company that does the cacao jam. So notice the color, right? So it's jam when it has this color. It's, it almost looks like a, a jelly, right? Um, so this has no pectin or it has no added pectin. So this is 100% cooked cacao honey to be made into a jam. So the cacao honey has enough pectin inside to solidify it this way. This is the cacao molasses. So if I were to take that cacao honey, cook it at very high temperature for a long time, then it becomes more of a molasses. So it becomes uh, more bitter. It still has the acidity, um, but it does uh, create some bitter notes. You could use it uh, the way you would use honey. You could use it for anything really. I mean, it's, it's a natural sweetener. So this is made by a company called Mais do Cacao. Extremely delicious. And um, 
and I, I used it. So everything that is on this presentation, I buy, I use, I consume. So I really like to use this in hot chocolate. So instead of sweetening with sugar, I like to sweeten with this molasses uh, flavored cacao honey. And then Casa Las Servicios is a chocolate maker in Brazil. And he makes a chocolate that is sweetened with this cacao honey. So he doesn't use any sugar. So there's no granulated sugar in here. This is cacao and cacao honey. And so it produces a sweet chocolate, making it a 100% cacao chocolate because it is 100% cacao, but it is sweetened with the honey. And it is absolutely delicious. Uh, and you can find all the information on his website, Casa Las Evicius. Uh, one question on this one. Somebody is asking, uh, if it's a honey, then water content, how is he handling the water content? Do you know uh, some answer for that? I don't know the exact, I actually do not know the exact recipe that he uses for this, but remember in that first image that I showed you. So once you cook to jam or molasses or the fruit leather, you've removed the water content in that, right? So my, the fruit leather that I had made, and I don't know if everyone knows what fruit leather is. It's basically, it's dehydrated, dehydrated juice. Um, in the US, we eat a lot of fruit leather as children. So everyone knows what this is. So I take the juice and you put it, let's say in a pan and you dehydrate it, you let air come in for, hours and then you're just kind of left with the solids right so all the water has evaporated so at that point you could use that to sweeten i don't know his exact process but i know that if i wanted to do that I, that's what i would do i would start with basically the fruit leather chop it into really little pieces and then put it into the melanger and test that out but you can put honey in chocolate and it will still solidify so it's basically a proportion you can't put too much um, of the, the liquid honey. You cannot use the, the raw cacao honey that we saw in the farm. Yes, you cannot use that because that has a lot of water. It has to be added in the, pro, in the step of the cacao jam, the cacao molasses or the cacao leather. Okay, I think that answers your question. Yes. <clears throat> And so then we also use it to make a lot of mixed drinks. Cacao honey with anything is spectacular. Cacao honey with rum, cacao honey with gin, cacao honey with vodka, cacao honey uh, with brandy, with cachaca. It, again, it's just the most refreshing, the most delicious thing you've ever had in your life. And so mixed drinks with cacao honey is very popular um, as well. One of the newer things is uh, kombucha. And kombucha is a fermented tea. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the manufacturers are now adding cacao honey to make it a little bit sweeter. And again, it's another product, it tastes amazing. And it's a way to naturally sweeten um, a beverage. And Dal, did someone else have a question about that? No, uh, not on that. There are some, some other questions, but we can ask those questions later. Okay. So I will just ask the question. Uh, only thing I want to uh, remind all the participants, please put your questions on the chat so we can moderate it and uh, interrupt Arthelia and ask the questions as relevant. And some of the questions we will ask at the end. So, right, uh, you know, don't raise hands now, but put the questions in the chat. Thank you. And then something that's very new, this actually launched about a month ago. Uh, so Dengo, the factory we talked about earlier, now is um, using that cacao honey to make this gin. And so this is a gin with cacao that is made from cacao honey. And uh, again, it's spectacular. Everything I'm showing you today is the best that I have seen of anything. And um, so now you have cacao, honey, gin. And there's actually a trend in Brazil 
of spirits made with cacao honey. So this is cacao water. You can look it up online, you'll find it. And this is a brandy that's also made of cacao honey. And then this is cauchasa. So it's a play on the Brazilian national spirit, cachaça, that is made from cane. And this one is made from cacao honey. So this is a young cachaça. And then this is a, an aged cachaça. So this cachaça, um, I have, so they only produce 300 of these bottles. I have number 50. And the box is amazing, right? Um, I have not opened it because I'm afraid. I, the, just the same way you, you get an amazing chocolate bar and you say, I'm gonna save it forever. You're not even going to eat it because it's so amazing. I feel this way about this Kamshasa. So I have to buy another one if they have it just so that I can taste it. I don't wanna open it. So this Kamshasa made from cacao honey, it takes 900 cocoa pods to produce one liter of kaushasa. Uh, so it's definitely a special product. And so this, the, so the kaushasa, uh, well, okay. So these are all the products that are made with uh, cacao honey. Again, this is not all the products that you can possibly make with cacao honey. These are the things that I see in Brazil that I have never seen anywhere else and I find spectacular. Um, cacao honey could be used as a honey, as a honey bee honey, right? It could be used as a sweetener. Uh, I use it to make milkshakes for my daughters. I use it to, um, to sweeten anything, cakes, pies, tarts. So I use it in everything. So it really is something that you could use for anything. I just didn't show everything, right? I just showed what I think is great. So that and our cacao honey. Now we're gonna go into cacao pulp. Once go again. ahead, Andal. Yeah. Artilia, somebody uh -huh. asking, can they purchase cacao honey in large quantities for export? Yeah, of course. Um, yes, you can. You just have to find the company that is willing to do it for you. You can, yes. But when they do like all this, uh, you know, um, you know, pasteurization, does it change the taste? In order for it to leave Brazil, it must be pasteurized. Yes, it changes the taste, but it's better than you not having anything. So if I had to live the rest of my life with pasteurized cacao honey or none, I would take pasteurized cacao honey. So absolutely, you don't have access to unpasteurized, but you have pasteurized and it's okay. You can still work with it and you can still do something with it, okay? And so that's cacao honey, right? That's I'm over there. Asking, you know, how long Go does ahead. it stay good without fermenting? So it will start fermenting. Um, <clears throat> it will start fermenting within maybe like an hour of you opening the cacao pod. So um, this is why it's so, this is why it hasn't made it to countries that don't grow cocoa. Because as soon as you open the pod, fermentation begins. And so you are, you've, you don't have a lot of time to get this into a container to get this, you know, packaged. So this is why you don't see it a lot because it's really complicated. Imagine being on a cocoa farm really far away from any good roads. You don't have electricity. You don't have air conditioning. You know, it's just, it's really complicated, right? In order for you to process cocoa honey on your farm is expensive. And so therefore it just hasn't made it out, right? Imagine you're in the Amazon jungle, right? You're like, you have to, you open your cocoa pods, and you still have to get on a canoe and then on a road and then it has to get on a little plane and then on a larger plane and then on a container it's just it's going to ferment there's no way that you're going to get fresh cacao pulp so uh or cacao honey as soon as you open the pot it be, the fermentation process begins 
And so you have a few hours to get that bottled or frozen or something, okay? Uh, okay, so that was cacao honey. Now we are talking about cacao pulp. And yes, it's something different. Cacao pulp, so the cacao honey, we let the cacao seeds sit on a mesh or, you know, there's actually special machines for this. Um, you let it sit and you grab the honey that naturally fell from the cocoa seeds. Now, cacao pulp, I so the cacao pulp, I have to, or there are machines for this, scrape off the white that you see on this seed. That's cacao pulp. So cacao honey is not cacao pulp. It's two different things, okay? Now we have cacao pulp. We have to remove that flesh from the seed. And this is sold at every Brazilian grocery store. So you can go to any Brazilian grocery store, go to the frozen, and it's frozen, right? So we're talking, we talked about the validity of this. You cannot find unfrozen cacao uh, honey or pulp. So even when I purchase my cacao honey at grocery stores, it's in the frozen section. So even though it's in the, that glass bottle in the um, whatever form it comes in, or it's meant for drinking, it's still in the frozen food section. So here we have the cacao and even, so this one here, this cacao pasteurized pomar, this is exported. And so for those of you that are interested, you could probably look up this company, Pomar. There's a lot of companies that do it. And these little packets get, this is how you will receive it wherever you are in these frozen little 100 gram packets. But this is a cacao pulp. And so you could buy it in this format or there's also these little frozen cubes that are meant for you to pop into your, um, into your mixer to make smoothies in the morning. And so my refrigerator or my freezer is always full of these at home because I experiment and try to put these in everything. Cause I'm just, it's a new product, right? Like if you are an American, uh, you've never, you don't have this in your house. You don't have this at the grocery store. And so I always buy a ton and every time I'm doing something, I open one and I try to put it in there to see what will happen because I just don't know what it's going to taste like or what it's going to do, how it's going to react. Um, and so I always keep these in my freezer. So these are available all over Brazil. It's normal. It's a, it's a normal thing. It's not like uh, exotic, like it would be for most people. And then there's also this juice, right? Um, which definitely pasteurized because it had, it's shelf stable. So this is those little boxes that you put the little straw in and then you drink. Um, so they, right here it says, right, cacao pulp. And so it's a normal drink in Brazil, right? Nothing exotic, nothing different. We use this cacao pulp to make, again, cocktails, right? So the best way to use cacao pulp or cacao honey, cocktails, it, it's just, so refreshing. So here is a uh, the frozen pulp with a little bit of a spirit, whatever you want to, whatever you like to drink, and then you top it with cocoa nibs. So refreshing, so delicious. And then here's a little smaller version that you can purchase. Here's another company that sells it. And so there are a lot of um, juice places also in Brazil, and so it's like the corner juice bar. You go there. And uh, you ask for essentially a milkshake, right? So this is milk and cacao pulp. And yes, it does taste good, but it doesn't have to be dairy. It doesn't have to come, you know, be cow milk. You can actually do this with coconut milk, with almond milk, whatever. And it just tastes amazing. Another normal thing in Brazil. Cacao pulp, like, a, like the cacao honey could be used for many things, right? So that were... That's my rooster. So those were the, what I think are the special things that are being made in Brazil with cacao pulp, right? You can do many more things with them. So now we're gonna move on to cacao beans. So oh, the granola is not what I meant to write here. So these um, cacao beans are 
the best cacao beans I have ever tasted in my life. No uh, place in Europe, in the United States, anywhere I've ever traveled, have I tasted this quality of uh, dry jade cocoa beans. So these are whole cocoa beans without the shell. It does not have the husk that have been caramelized and then put into a tumbler and coated with chocolate and then dusted with brown sugar. So this is again, a product of Dengo. And it's for me, I can eat these all day. They're delicious. I have never met anyone that likes it. Even though you're eating a cocoa bean, it's not bitter. It's actually still very sweet. It's the best interpretation of anything I've ever seen made with a cocoa bean. And this is actually the only thing under my category, cacao beans, because everything else I've seen, this was the only thing that when I tasted it and I had it, it shocked me. It's so delicious. And so Dengo actually sells different varieties of it. They have some dusted with um, white sugar. They have some dusted with cocoa powder, um, some enrobed in milk chocolate, but they're all delicious. Now we're going to nibs. Everyone knows nibs. So in Brazil, there is this thing called a brigadeiro, which is like a truffle somewhat. So instead of rolling in nuts or powder uh, or cocoa powder, the candies are being rolled in cocoa nibs, which add this other layer, right, of crunchiness, the texture, uh, the flavor, it actually ends up being just, it, it's not just a candy, it's almost like a food. It ends up being really delicious. And so rolling or using the actual nibs in um, as an ingredient is something pretty big in Brazil, uh, leaving them whole so that you can see them and taste them and appreciate the texture. And then we have granolas. So granolas are really huge in Brazil and Generally, it always has cocoa nibs. So cocoa nibs in Brazil is, is kind of like, a, it's a part of a diet, right? You, you have it all the time. And it's very hard to find a granola without cocoa nibs. And so here is one brand that I really like. And it has, um, and it's a very Brazilian granola as well, right? So taking nibs and making it yours, whatever you have in your country, adding that to this, granola, right? So this is a very Brazilian granola. It has, um, it has Brazil nuts. No, it has cashew, which is Brazilian. And then it has baru nuts, which is also another Brazilian nut and obviously the coconut. And so anyways, making your mix of nibs with whatever is local to your environment. And then this is also one of my very favorite things, uh, nibs in honey. My cat is falling. So nibs in honey, right? So this is not um, this is not cacao honey. This is honey bee honey. But you put the nibs inside. You, you just let it sit there, and then when you're ready to use it, you put it on top of yogurt. So now you have nibs that have been um, infused in honey. And you put that on top of yogurt, you could put it on top of ice cream, you could put it on top of whatever you want, coffee, uh, anything, right? So it's, again, one of the most delicious things I've ever had. And this is uh, the company, it's Mabi, which is the honey company. And then the nibs are from Ama, which is the chocolate company. So this is a partnership of a honey maker with a chocolate maker or a cocoa farmer, actually. He makes chocolate, but these are his nibs from his farm. And so for me, this product also is pretty amazing. And then we have people taking the nibs and infusing them in alcohols to make liquors. So these are very, very sweet uh, alcoholic beverages, I guess you can call it. Um, so they take the cacao and they infuse it. They leave the nibs in liquor so that it can take some of that flavor into the liquid and then they sieve it. And now you have a product 
that doesn't have nibs, but that was sitting in nibs. And so it has the flavor of the nibs. And this is another, so cocktails, <laughs> cocktails are very big in Brazil. People like to have fun, uh, but they find all these great ways to use the cocoa, right? So here it are also, this is a drink where the nibs have been sitting in the gin and then they take the gin off and they use that gin to make cocktails. And so you have the flavor of the cocoa nibs without the nibs. Brazil has a lot of uh, uh, German immigrants, uh, German ancestry. And so beer is actually huge in Brazil. There's uh, a lot of um, beer makers and all the beers I'm gonna show you here are produced in Brazil, mostly in the south of Brazil, where uh, most of the uh, European immigrants landed. So this is a ale that was made with chocolate. Here is another beer that's made with chocolate, well, nibs. When it says chocolate, but it's nibs. It's made with nibs and peppers, chili peppers. So this is a stout made with nibs. Here we have another one made with nibs. And really the list of cacao infused beers is huge in Brazil. This is one of the most popular ones. So this is them celebrating Easter in a few weeks. So it's like hops and cacao. And of course, there's also this new trend of people making chocolate spreads. So using the nibs, grinding it with local ingredients. So the cashew, I know they grow a lot of cashew in India, but cashew is native to Brazil. It's native to the Amazon rainforest. And so we can, so it is considered uh, Brazilian. So this is nibs ground with cashews to make a spread. This one here is uh, nibs ground with Brazil nuts to make the spread. So using those uh, nibs in various forms to do many different things, okay? So then that concludes nibs. So now we're gonna move into packaging. So here we see, so this is a chocolate maker that's in the Amazon rainforest and she uses the leaf of the cocoa tree to package cacao. Yes, I know, sanitation. So this is considered an artisanal product. I have traveled to her factory. I know the factory. I have bought this chocolate. I have made this chocolate. Um, some of the best restaurants in Brazil buy this chocolate like this and use it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, so you can definitely, I mean, the leaves have been sanitized. So she washes them in a solution to sanitize them beforehand and she uses them. So here the leaves are fresh, right? So they, they must be fresh, fresh. So she is a tree to bar. So she makes the chocolate where she grows the cocoa. So she has access to fresh leaves all the time. So she takes a fresh leaf, packages her chocolate. And in a few days, the leaf dries and then it's a dried leaf, but it, it still protects the chocolate, right? So using the cocoa leaf of the tree to do packaging. Here is another company also in the Amazon. What you see here are cocoa leaves, but they are already in their dry format. So they use it the same way that um, Filia do Kombu, which is the previous one that I showed you, right? You just wrap the leaf around the chocolate bar. But then on the other side, we see boxes actually made with the cacao leaf. And so this is a box that has, um, you know, the under layer is a box made of cardboard, but then the top has been fitted with cocoa leaves. And so these are real cocoa leaves. So aside from this, they also put bonbons or truffles in the middle of a leaf and then they pick it up and then they put a string around it. And so they use it in that format as well. So just using it in whatever capacity. I have also bought um, bottles, like glass bottles that have been wrapped with cocoa leaves 
kind of like this. I just uh, couldn't find it. Um, so using the leaves as the packaging itself. And also um, packaging using the cocoa pod, using the image of the cocoa pod of, uh, on the packaging itself. So these are two companies, but it almost every um, chocolate or cacao company in Brazil likes to use the cocoa as the packaging. So using it as art, using it as inspiration, using it visually to put on your packaging. So packaging is twofold, right? It's actually using something from the tree to package it or using the imagery of the tree to package. And then everyday, everyday use of the word of the culture of chocolate. So we have a grocery store that has, um, it's nine grocery stores in Sao Paulo where you can go buy bread, chicken, whatever it is you use on a daily basis. It's called Chocolate Land, but you also go here to buy chocolate and all of your supplies to package chocolate, uh, chocolate related. So it's, it's literally a grocery store based on chocolate that also sells chicken and beer and whatever. It's like you go for the chocolate and then if you need other things to survive like chicken and beer, then you get that too. But you're kind of going here for the chocolate, right? Uh, so chocolate, it, the interpretation of chocolate culturally is different right here in Brazil, which I love. So at this store, you can buy napkins. So these are napkins. So this is Chocolandia. We're, we're still talking about that grocery store. You could buy these beautiful napkins. Look at these napkins. These are just napkins that you go into the store and you buy, right? So again, using the cocoa pot as art and everyday things. Beautiful. This is foil that you buy at this same grocery store, Chocolandia. So you have the cocoa pods and you have the cocoa flour and it's just foil for you to use to package your eggs or whatever you want to put foil on. And now we move on to a uh, something you see at the mall. So Cacao Show is a uh, chocolate store. It's a chocolate franchise. It's the largest chocolate franchise in the world. It has about 2,000 locations in Brazil alone. And so just to give you an idea, in the United States, we have Seas Candies. Seas Candies has 200 stores. Cacao Show has 2,000 stores in Brazil. So just to give you an idea of the grandeur of it all. And Cacao Show is very important because they really do focus on um, talking about cocoa, talking about uh, chocolate in a different form. If you walk into a Seas candy store or a uh, Mount Chocolate Mountain or Mountain Chocolate Factory, uh, something along those lines, or Godiva Chocolate, you walk into almost any chocolate store in the world you won't see a cocoa pod. You're not gonna see molds. You're not gonna, see, like you just don't see any of this stuff, right? It's, it's like, where does any, all of this come from? Cacao Show actually makes a really big effort to have people understand that chocolate comes from the cocoa pod. And so this is one of their lo locations. So on the left, you see molds. You see a lot, a lot of molds. On the right, you could barely see it, but it has a really large cocoa pod. Right, so they use cocoa pods all over their store so that people have a relationship between cocoa pods and chocolate. And here on the left, on the right, is the uniform of Cacao Show. Isn't that amazing? I tried to buy one of these shirts once, but I couldn't get it. So you see that the uniform is cocoa pods. And then this is the bag. If you buy products at Cacao Show, this is the bag you get a piece of art, right? So using cocoa pods in your um, packaging at your store, using cocoa pods on your clothes for your employees, for you, great idea. And then here we have the outside wall of Cacao Show. So they have on record, Guinness world record, 
the largest chocolate mural in the world. So you can see here the freeway, you can see the bus. Look at how big this thing is, right? So it's a chocolate bar and it's a Brazilian guy on a canoe in a chocolate river and he's carrying cocoa pods. And so, I, I mean, look just the grandeur of this, right? Like even behind it, you can see there's like another factory that looks really little. This thing is huge, it's humongous. And then here I just did a close up so that you see the cocoa pods are, there is the guy, the guy that's painting this mural, which is a famous Brazilian muralist uh, named Cobra, K-O-B-R-A. He does amazing things everywhere. Uh, but you can see him working on the mural, right? I mean, it's spectacular. It's just, it's the best thing ever. I love this thing. I love that it's in Brazil. I love that it's the largest chocolate mural in the world. And so again, using the cocoa as inspiration for art. And your kitchen, your kitchen needs cocoa pods. So here is a, um, another company that's based in Rio that sells products. Again, a very normal thing, right? You probably have something in your kitchen that has a rooster or a lemon or a chicken. And here it's cocoa pods, right? Beautiful. A pencil, you can, you can in the middle of that pencil, it's, it's a cocoa pod. So you can get pencils with cute chocolate. Candles in your home. So I know that, um, right? So that you can make candles with the cocoa husk so that it gives off a chocolate flavor. So here they do, if you go to their website, you will see that they have about four different candles related to cacao. And then we have cosmetics. Like I know, you know that we use cocoa butter in many cosmetics, but this is a cosmetics company and look what they have on the packaging, right? Like this, they're selling you um, cacao exfoliant, perfume, creams, uh, soaps, but they have the cacao pod there. Like it's not like the focus is cacao, right? So they have a, a whole cacao fruit, they have cut cacao fruit. And so you see this everywhere. Like it's very normal as an ingredient in your cosmetics to have this and for you to understand that. And that's the main ingredient, right? So the, the selling point here is the cacao. And on the right, you, there is there are three little images and you see that the middle image is a cocoa fruit as well. And then here are two other ones. So at my corner drugstore, always I can get this cocoa butter lip balm. And on the right is a cacao uh, perfume, if you wanna smell like cacao. <laughs> and then at the, um, at the store where you get the whole uh, supplies to fix your house, you can get this paint and they have a color that's called cacao pulp. So you'd say to the guy, I want cacao pulp paint. It's not made with cacao pulp, it's just the color. So the, this color, that, that square that you see behind it, that's the color of cacao pulp and that's the color of this paint. And then another form of art. So this is a ceramicist in Bahia and she makes um, these cocoa pods that look pretty realistic. Um, she makes them in all the sizes. There's tiny and then there's huge. And her the name is called Cores da Teja. You can Google her, you'll find her. Um, but these pieces I have never seen anywhere else in the world. They are ceramic. They're delicate, they're fragile, they look amazing. And this is something normal that people buy and they have in their home as a decorative piece, right? So normalizing the use of the cacao pod. And fashion. So again, in Italy, it's very big to put lemons on clothes. In Brazil, 
we put cacao on clothes. And so this is a company that um, it's just a fashion designer, right? So here are some uh, Brazilian fruits on there. So there's Guarana and then there's cacao. Who doesn't want to wear this bathing suit to the beach? Cacao pods, right? So beautiful. This bag also, right? Huge bag uh, for you to keep all of your chocolate. So again, cacao pods. Making cacao pods normal. A skirt. Pants and a shirt. And we have a dress, beautiful, beautiful dress with bananas and cacao pods. And in the early 2000s, there was a chocolate, uh, there was a soap opera that's called Sh Sh Chocolate Compimenta. Very famous, very popular. Every time I talk about chocolate to most people, they reference this soap opera. They say, oh, I know about making chocolate because I saw it on this soap opera. So this is a every Brazilian in the world has watched this soap opera. And this soap opera was based in a chocolate factory. So this, what you're seeing here is the chocolate factory. Obviously, you know, it's a stage, but um, they talked about chocolate, they made chocolate, the, the entire town worked at the chocolate factory. So it, it's, um, it's nice to see that it's such it's just such a normal thing, right? It's a job. It's a, ch a chocolate factory is a normal job, and people do it. Uh, and so culturally, it's very integrated into Brazilians' memory because this is something that everyone watched, everyone knows about. And one of the most famous novels um, in the history of Brazil is actually this novel here, Cacao by Jorge Amado, and it takes place on a cacao farm. And so um, you get to read a lot about um, slavery, about the economic hardships of having a cocoa farm. Um, but culturally, it's a very important book to Brazilians, not to the cacao or chocolate industry, but to the Brazilian culture. And of course, um, right, like awareness, like having chocolate festivals, having cocoa festivals. Um, I think Brazil has the most chocolate festivals in the world. They, they bring together not only chocolate makers and chocolatiers, but cocoa producers, which is very important, right? Like to bring the awareness, to have everyone come together so that um, you can close that gap of where does chocolate come from, right? So you, you have people that are making the cocoa or producing the cocoa and the people that are making the chocolate. And then the artists, the chocolatiers that are working with the chocolate that the chocolate makers are having. And so these events, obviously all on pause for now, but I would suggest anyone to come to Brazil to visit some of these events because they are very informative. And of course, um, you, a, a lot of the products and a lot of the, um, the success that we have had in Brazil is due to the teamwork that we have built. So there is a bean to bar association where we all help and teach and work collectively to make Brazil the best cocoa producing country in the world and the best chocolate making country in the world. So this is our association being to bar Brazil. And then there's also a subgroup or a smaller group of women chocolate makers with the same focus. It's about helping and supporting other chocolate makers. So um, I am pretty certain that the uh, association in Brazil is the first bean to bar association in the world that only focuses on bean to bar chocolate makers or tree to bar. We are tree and bean to bar. So, um, have, so, and this is an innovation, right? So creating a group that solely has the focus of improving chocolate, improving cocoa so that uh, we, we all have access to a better product is um, 
is something that really I, I feel everyone that's growing that lives in a growing country should focus on developing because it really is helpful to the entire industry in general. And then this machine. So this is the only machine I'll be talking about, but it is the most fancy machine I've ever seen on a cocoa farm. So this is from a Brazilian. Um, this is a Brazilian machinist. I don't know what you call it, a Brazilian person in Espiritu Santo. His email is below. That's making machines to um, help speed up the process of making chocolate or producing cocoa. So this machine he invented and you put your cocoa pot there and in the center, right before it goes into this drum, there is a blade that slices it open, but it's a blade that is, um, that has like a, a, a bouncing or a cushion. I don't know what you call it, right? So that it's not slicing all of them with the same pressure. So it kind of monitors the size of the pod and if it's smaller, it goes lower. And if it's big, it doesn't slice as much. Um, and so it cuts it open. And then it flies into this drum and there are holes in it. So the holes are big enough to let the cocoa seed fall, but it's not big enough uh, to let the pods fall. So the pods exit through the back and the seeds fall on another side. And then the machine is still under <laughs> uh, evolution because it's still dropping. You see all those colorful pieces are still cocoa pods. So it's still dropping a few cocoa pods, but he, this is maybe his first generation and he's now on his possibly third generation. So the new machines should not be dropping as much um, pod, but this is a way so that uh, people are not using machetes anymore, right? They're not slicing things open. And it's how, I mean, it's pretty fast, right? It's definitely faster than any human. So this is uh, possibly the most impressive innovation I've seen with machines. <laughs> A lot of questions about that. And so then that's it, everyone. I mean, that's where I decided to stop this could go on forever. So the use of not only cocoa iconography, right? So the use of using the cocoa pod as an image, um, but using it in everyday, everyday things like uh, a, a, a cup, right? In your lotion, um, your juice, your smoothie, using it on your clothes, all of that really helps bring attention to the movement of cocoa, right? Of chocolate, of quality, of valuing this product that, um, that really is sacred, right? And so those are a few things that I see in Brazil. And um, I hope that you guys learned a little bit about what's happening there and hopefully something that you can replicate in your country or wherever you are. And so let's go for the questions, Angel. Um, 